Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel reading from Luke 1, before the sermon I'll reread verses 34 through 38. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came once in humility, but who will come again in all of his glory. Dear Christian friends, nothing lasts forever. In 2006, the United States government paid for a laptop, and this laptop was state-of-the-art as far as these things go in 2006, with a screen that pivots and faces whatever direction you want to face, having a tablet function a few years before the iPad came out, could write on it with a stylus. And the only reason that that laptop is now sitting in our house Available for our use is because some nice Marine who went to our former congregation dug it out of the dumpster for us in 2009. Such is government spending. And as taxpayers, you need to be thanked. Thank you for buying us our laptop. Nothing lasts forever. The cars we drive are all going to end up in the junkyard. Our bodies are getting older and older. And eventually, we, if God lets this world spin long enough, are going to pass away. And will the world notice? No. I mean, someone wiser than me once remarked that when you're a kid or a teenager, you don't care at all what the world thinks about you. When you're in your 20s and 30s, you care very much about what the world thinks about you. When you hit 40 and beyond, you finally realize the world isn't thinking about you at all. And that's us. As far as this world is concerned, you and I just aren't that, very, that, that important. We're insignificant. Just a handful of the seven billion people here in this world right now. What do we matter? There was a woman, a very young woman, an insignificant woman, who lived in an insignificant little town, 70 miles north of Jerusalem, to whom an angel came and said, I have an announcement. And this announcement didn't just change her life, it changed everyone's life. Well, to insignificant people today, like you and me, God has an announcement. Yes, I have an announcement. It's about what God thinks of you, not what the world thinks of you, and what God has done for you. I don't think we can hear the story of the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, and not wonder, just for a minute, what if God came to me? What if God sent an angel to me and said, I have an announcement. You are a vital part of the plan of salvation that, I, that God is enacting. You have a role to play. How would you react if an angel appeared to you today and said, God had something vitally important for you to do? Would you believe it? Mary's relative, Zacharias, did not believe it. Six months prior to the fact when the angel came to him and said that he and his wife would conceive the forerunner of the Savior, John the Baptist, he didn't believe it. Too old. Is that what some of you might think if an angel came to you and said, I've got something for you to do that God wants you to do? <laughs> Too old. Or would some of you say, Too young. Why don't you wait until I finish my career? Or why don't you wait until I finish school? 
You sure you've got the right person here? Well, the way we might answer that hypothetical question of how we would react to an angel coming to us and telling us, I have an announcement and you're involved in something really, really big here, is actually reflected in the way we get ready for the holidays. Of everything that you do in and around your house, how much of it is done thinking about Christ? How much of it is done thinking about friends and family members and traditions that need to be upheld? Not that there's anything wrong with taking care of friends and family members or having nice traditions to let the kids remember the holidays by, but these cannot be the central part of our holiday, our holiday celebration, can they? Or are they sometimes? And then when opportunities come about for us to spend more time in our, in our Lord's house, more time contemplating the message, do we find that to be kind of an unnecessary distraction because we've already heard this story before? I mean, no one seems to have a problem setting aside a few more hours per week in the weeks leading up to Christmas for shopping. But an Advent service in the middle of the week? Eh, we could take it or leave it sometimes. Mary made the time. Let it be to me as you have said, she said. I am God's servant, whatever God wills. What an example for us to follow. This is the fourth Sunday, though, of the Advent season, and our focus really isn't Mary. On the fourth Sunday of the Advent season, we light the, the angel candle on the Advent wreath, but our focus really isn't the angel either. It is the message that the angel gave to Mary about the one that Mary would carry, the Son of God himself. God incarnate. Our first reading pointed to him already when God, through the prophet, came to King David and said, someone from your own body, a descendant of yours, is going to establish an everlasting kingdom, a house for my name. And we have the word forever spelled out for us in our text as well, as the angel Gabriel says that the child that Mary would bear would rule forever. Forever is a long time, and nothing lasts forever. But our Savior's rule does. The thing, though, that we notice about our Savior's rule, our Savior's glory, is that it is so often hidden. As Mary had the baby Jesus growing inside of her, Nobody walked up to Mary and said, Oh, look, there's the Son of God inside of you. God's glory was hidden. On Christmas Eve, God hid the glory of his Son by having him born in a stable, laid in a cattle's feeding trough. Throughout his life, though glimpses of his glory were bound to shine through, Jesus lived humbly, as a poor man, without any traces of the glory that people might have expected of an everlasting king. And as he bled on the cross, Jesus' glory was hidden underneath his pain and suffering. And God's glory continues to be hidden today, too. We don't necessarily like it that it's hidden. <laughs> It would be wonderful, we might think, if God would make a grandstand show in some way that would make everyone sit up and take notice of who he is. It would make it so e much easier for us to talk about God if we had something like that that we could point to. But God's glory remains hidden. Yes, we pray for God's glory sometimes to be revealed. When someone is sick, when someone is injured, we pray that God glorify his name by giving that person healing, and it could be that God chooses to do so, but it also could be that in his wisdom God chooses not to do so. He will do what he will do, and he will do because he knows what best to do. Some people think that they can bring about God's glory or see God's glory inside of themselves. These people don't really know God. 
Because if a person looks inside of himself or herself, all they're really going to see is their own failures. Some people have tried to create religions that are all about the glory of whatever God it is that they worship. But God's glory can't be brought down because we've decided to bring it down. God is the one who chooses to reveal it. And he has decided to give us just one place that we can go again and again and see his glory right now. And that one place is the humble gospel. Shared by weak human beings. Written down by sinners under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That gospel message is where the glory of God is. That gospel message is the message that tells us of the everlasting rule of Christ. And we praise God this season that it's the gospel message that he's planted in our hearts. And of course, that gospel message does something for us. If we're going to judge a ruler or someone who has authority, especially in our federal government, how are we going to judge them? How, how, how are we going to evaluate them? Well, aren't we going to evaluate them on whether or not they were able to achieve and maintain peace? I mean, certainly, sometimes circumstances arise that causes a, a nation to need to, a, a nation to rise up and deploy its military forces, but, but then you hope that those forces are successful and that peace can be restored. We want a leader who will give us peace with all the other nations in this world. We want leaders who will give us economic peace so that people aren't so tied to the ups and downs of the stock market. But even if we're granted these blessings, peace between nations, economic peace, we know that these are only temporary blessings. Eventually, there will be some new danger in the world. And there will be more wars. Eventually, there will be an economic downturn. And, every, and so many people are going to be out of work again, and lose their life savings. That is the way of the world. The same thing is true inside of each of us. We can feel at peace at any given time, that things are going okay. And then something comes along and shatters that peace. It always does. We never remain truly peaceful. That's where this ruler, this everlasting ruler, is so unique. He brings about everlasting peace. Peace between God. Peace between human beings. This peace that he brings about is peace that he had to pay for. That's the only reason it can be lasting, because he came as God himself, to give himself as a sacrifice to make peace between us and our God. And how then do we become members of this kingdom of peace? Well, it isn't in the way that the world would predict. First of all, you can't be born into this kingdom. You can't claim citizenship in this kingdom by birthright, like we can our American citizenship. Now, in order for us to be members of this kingdom of peace, we have to believe some unbelievable things. First of all, we have to believe that even though outwardly our lives are probably better than most people's in this world, we have to believe that we are still rotten to the core sinners because we offend our God, even if what comes through on the outside looks pretty good. We have to believe that. And we have to believe that that little baby who was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago was at the same time a human being and holy God. We have to believe that. And we have to believe that that baby, after he grew up into a man 33 years later, paid the full price for ours and the world's sins so that we can go to heaven. We have to believe these things, and you and I by ourselves can't believe them. We can't, because they don't make any sense to us. But our everlasting king, in setting up his kingdom, has decided that you and I are going to be part of that kingdom. 
This is how he has decided that we will believe these things. He has sent someone into our hearts to create faith in these unbelievable things. Coming to us through holy baptism, strengthening us through the sacrament of the altar, reminding us again and again through the preaching of his word that he is exactly who he said he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, almighty God incarnate in human form. So I have an announcement. Not only has God shown his love to you in sending you a Savior, he's not done with you either. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the angel candle, but we are not likely to see any angels here this morning. Neither has God entrusted to angels the sacred work of telling people about this little baby who was at the same time both God and man. He's entrusted that work to you and to me. We are the announcers in this day and age. Just as the kids are going to do at 4.30 this afternoon, we gladly announce to the world as we have opportunity that Jesus has come, that Jesus rules whether people see him or not, and that Jesus is coming back. Yes, the season of Advent is partially about getting ready for Christmas, but that's almost a secondary point, because Christmas has come and, come and gone. It's history. Jesus coming the second time, though, is something for which we are waiting, just as all those people in the Old Testament waited for that first Christmas. And yes, you can very well make a case that life is getting harder. Not only do things not last forever, but the situation around us seems to be deteriorating in society. Immorality is celebrated more and more in this world today. There are dangers spiritually and physically out there that there just weren't, that that weren't there in, in generations past. But you and I have been given something. The everlasting king. He rules for us. He rules for us right now in a way that we do not often see. He will rule for all eternity in a way that we can see. We throw around the words joy and peace during this season so freely. But through the reign of our King Jesus, you and I have reason to speak those words and mean them when we say them. Joy to the world. Peace on earth. May that be the center of our holiday celebrations. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus.